right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Resource Insider Podcast. As usual, I'm your host, Jamie Keach. Today on the podcast, I had the chance to sit down with Zimmy Mika, the founder and CEO of Asenko Engineering, one of the largest mining engineering firms on the planet. We talk about where the mining industry is headed, the effects COVID has had, um, where the best mines are built and located, who's better, Australian or Canadian mining engineers, and Zimmy's long experience in this business. One of the most interesting conversations I've had in a long time. I hope you would enjoy it as much as I do. Without further ado, let me please introduce Zimmy Mika from Asenko Engineering. Zimmy, welcome to the Resource Insider podcast today. You are our second Australian guest, so thank you very much for coming here. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to having a chat with you today. Yes, yeah, me as well. And you know, I've been I've been kind of preparing for this for a while, and I was with a couple of our mutual uh, friends and colleagues last night, and I asked them, "What should I ask you? What should I What should I start with?" What's a good story to start with? And what they said to me, and I asked them not to tell me too much about it because I wanted to get the full story from you, is they said, ask him about the time he had to defuse landmines. <laughs> and uh. this is a story I think I'm very interested in because I once knew a girl in university when I was becoming a mining engineer and she asked me if I made landmines. So I told her, yes, I did. That was what I was preparing <laughs> for. But it sounds like you've actually had experience with landmines. Actually, unexploded ordnances. Slight, slight difference. Okay. And I'll explain. I'll explain. I'll explain it uh, in a in a sec. Um, some years ago, we were asked to look at a project in Laos for Owen Hegarty when Owen was the chief executive of Oxiana Resources, mm -hmm. and we just completed the the Chattery Gold project in Thailand. So we had some regional experience. And Owen rang me and he said, look, you know, you've done a great job with Chattery. We'd love to take you up to Laos. Um, why don't you come and have a look at this project? It's a gold project followed by a very, very good copper project. And I said, Laos, not sure, Owen, um, you know, socialist country. I don't hear great things about it. He said, look, just, just jump on a plane, come up and have a look. And so um, I flew up with, with one of my guys um, and this particular project, the Sepon project, uh, is, is 42 kilometres up the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And uh, it took us seven hours to traverse the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So it was, it was heavy jungle, 80 creek crossing, really difficult place to get to. Uh, the logistics were difficult. We had to cross the Mekong River. It was a full day of driving to get to the site. And history, um, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was the most bombed part of the Vietnam War. So you had 4.2 million uh, pounds of explosives dropped on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. 30% of them didn't go off. So there were unexploded 750-pound, 1,000-pound bombs all the way through this trail up to the mine site. And when you got to the mine site, a lot of these bombs had fallen vertically, hit the mud because it rains four metres a year, and scooted along three or four metres underground. So you didn't know that they were there until you started to disturb the earth. So got to site, absolutely bucketed rain, like droplets the size of baseballs, just <laughs> pounded the place. And uh, jungle, hot, all of this sort of stuff. And I turned around and I, I said to Owen, Looks like we're in, Owen. We're going to build you a gold mine. And uh, <laughs> off, off we went. We had to upgrade the road to 42 kilometres. We had we found lots of unexploded ordinances, which we had to either diffuse, which wasn't a great way of doing them. They used to, the, the specialists just used to blow them up in situ. Um, we had rainfall. We lost excavators in creeks because the creeks came up so, so quickly. We had trucks rolling over in the mud as I was going to site. Um, I mean, it was just, it was logistically just a challenge. You know, the, the, the unexploded ordinances were just one part of this whole, you know, menagerie of issues that we had to deal with. Anyway, we built him a gold mine. He was happy. His market cap went from, I don't know, 20 million to uh, probably four or 500 million. Then we built the, the, the copper project for him, which was a world-class copper project. 
ended up with a market cap of seven billion dollars about two years later, and uh, you know the rest is history. But a hallmark project for us because logistically very very challenging. The technology we used was cutting edge, world class. Um, yeah, it was just a just a great great beachhead for us. One of, probably one of the funnest projects I've been involved with actually, even though the challenges were there. So Zimmy, you know the situation you described there doesn't sound like one that maybe everyone would say, yeah, we're in. Like, what was it that made you think, you know, this is something we want to do. This is something I want to allocate Asenko's resources and brain power and capital towards. Yeah, that's a good question, Jamie. A, a lot of companies would shy away from those challenges. That's not us. Um, you know, we're, we're about finding a better way and, and challenging our boundaries and delivering Delivering what's not possible in some instances, that's what drives us. Um, we love that challenge and we thrive on that challenge, whereas other people see a huge amount of risks and shy away from it. Well, we see the challenge, how do we manage the risk, how do we deliver an outcome, how do we deliver value and put our brightest and best on it to, to you know, to, to go, go on and make it happen. Um, kind of like that, that sort of thing, you know. And where were you at this point in Asenko's uh, lifespan? What you know? What yeah. when can you place us where this was in, in your career and in the in the life of Asenko Engineering? Yeah, sure. I mean, Asenko started in ninety one. This was about two thousand and and four five somewhere in there, early two thousands. We would have been uh, lucky to have been two hundred people. You know, we were a small company, two fifty at most. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it really put us on the map. Um, you know, today we're three thousand odd people, you know, twenty five offices, eighty percent of our revenues in the Americas. And it's a very different organisation. So, so yeah, it did. It did. You know, really, really a turning point for our company. So you know, a lot of what I want to talk about today is you know, what makes great projects, what makes great teams uh, that are able to execute on these projects and, and succeed. And, you know, something I've noticed amongst the most successful people in this sector, whether they're running an engineering firm, whether they're geologists, what have it, what have you, is kind of a willingness to go where others won't. And, and that can be taking geographical risk and going to places that others consider challenging politically or, or geographically, or it can mean taking geological risk and, and using more new exploration techniques and looking in places others might not. As a general question, you know, how important do you think that is to succeed in the mining world? Ultra. I mean, it is the differentiator that you can you can uh, have to, to achieve success. Um, I think if I look at if I look at us, you know, we've been all about trying to find a better way, adding value, uh, reducing cost, ensuring that there's best business outcome for the project rather than just executing a project. And you said, you know, what, what makes success? People. You know, you've got to, it's the old story. You've got to have the right people from beginning to end. You've got to have a good old body and you've got to be able to think laterally and think how can I do something rather than how can, can't I do something? You know, you, it's really easy for people to focus on the negatives and give you you know, 20 reasons why you can't. Well, you know, let's not, well, let's not focus on that. Let's focus on what we can do. And if you look at the most successful projects, that's what, that's what it's been about. It's been about finding a solution, whether it be the right exploration techniques, you know, the innovative uh, ways of looking at geophysics, et cetera, et cetera, and then innovative ways of processing and executing. And if you're not prepared to do that, then your success rate's going to drop. So I, I think if you look at, if you look at the industry, there are great examples of that. There is, but it's all around people and it's all around people's willingness to, to, to sort of go that extra mile, take on some risk and deliver an outcome. Okay. So on this podcast, we've had a lot of finance types. We've had some geologists. We have had a painful few number of engineers, which I'm as an engineer always kind of sad about. And for someone that's had a far more successful engineering career than I have, what something I'd like to ask you is, you know, having trained and worked with and mentored hundreds, if not thousands, what makes a great engineer? You know, when investors are looking at mining projects, you know, so many of them are finance guys, accounting types, 
and they're 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 trying to gauge a management team and they're trying to figure out if these guys are going to be able to deliver on what they say they're going to do. What do you think makes an engineer that can go out and build and execute and succeed at these things? Yeah, look, I, that's a really good question. I think I think it's a combination of very competent technical skills, being able to do something with a dollar that takes someone off the street ten dollars. So it's that innovation. It's that accepting the challenge. But I also think a business overlay. So understanding that there is a business solution that's required here at the end of the day. It's not just purely, you know, designing and building the best widget, which some engineers can do. Mm -hmm. And I think if you combine that technical with that business overlay, you have a very, very powerful uh, person who can add a lot of value to a project. And, uh, you know, a little bit of entrepreneurism mixed in there as well. Um, And I think you've got the perfect uh, engineer. Now, as you know, engineers aren't the greatest communicators. So if you can find one that communicates, well, then you're really on the winner. Yeah. Yeah. How, you know, how much of that do you think can, can you can attribute your own success to the ability to, to communicate effectively and, and, you know, tell the story behind these projects and, and what needs to get done and kind of rally people behind an idea and a, and a goal here? Yeah. Look, I think, I think that's probably helped me a lot in my career. Um, but I think what's been even more telling in my career has been a, a, the ability to pick people with great potential and being able to support them to achieve success um, and to, you know, ensure that I can influence a, a vision that, that they can get behind. I think that's probably been, you know, a key to my success is, is to have just some really great people um, doing great things and, and I cheerlead them along. I think that's the that's that's probably been something that I've been able to add value, I guess. Okay. So we kind of just launched right into this conversation, but, you know, for people who have never heard the name uh, Zimmy Mika before and Senko Engineering, can you give us the 30,000-foot view of, of what a Senko is, what you guys do, what your sort of mission is? Yeah, sure. So we're, we're an engineering uh, service provider, all in the mining space, so we do very little else. We do a little bit of infrastructure and oil and gas, but a small amount. We're a global player. Um, it originated in Australia, 91, myself and a colleague of the founders of the company. Um, we are very focused now in the Americas, North and South America, 80, 85% of our revenue balance is Australia and Africa. Um, and we work in, in mine development from, you know, early phase environmental work, uh, feasibility studies, uh, design, construction, commissioning and operation and predominantly in gold, silver, base metals, pretty much all commodities, but that, that's a real strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and our view is uh, we don't just sort of rock up and offer the same kind of uh, solutions that, that our competitors are about. We're all about trying to find a better way. That's our, our purpose. That's why we exist. And that could mean technically, that could mean in execution, that could mean in operation, but we're always looking at ways to be innovative and you know, keep the capital cost low and deliver a good business outcome for our clients. So that's that's our that's our DNA. Can you can you give me an example of of what it means to find a better way, or, or sure, or how you guys would have approached something differently than some of your competitors? Yeah, yeah, no problem. I mean, if you look at um, uh, the Moose River project in uh, which people in North America would know about it in Nova Scotia. A mm-hmm. um, couple of things there. Um, that's a two million ton gold processing facility mine that, that was completed for Canadian one hundred thirty two million dollars. Whereas you know typically the, the two hundred plus two fifty plus rolls off the tongue for that size of project, and you know we were able to do that innovatively with smaller footprint. Um, uh, process uh, initiatives, construction techniques on how we modularize and bolt tanks rather than weld them in situ. And then we, then commercially, we offered it on a fixed price turnkey basis. So the client had no risk on the cost. And so we put our balance sheet and our money uh, to risk to, to deliver an outcome because we were so confident we could do it. 
so that's a really good example yeah. of of you know where the costs are, are are contained. Another example, if if you can indulge me for a sec, Jamie, is the Constantia got a copper mine in Peru, which we completed for Hud Bay. Um, that was a one point seven five billion dollar a US dollar project, about 85,000 tonne a day. Um, you know, typically in South America, that would have a two bill plus price tag, 2.2, 2.4. And again, smaller footprint, no building, um, you know, innovative processing. Uh, we were able to, you know, take the capital out of it uh, significantly. And it's demonstrable. I mean, those numbers are out there. We've benchmarked it. It's one of the lowest cost producers in the world so uh, from a capital perspective so there's there's demonstrable examples of this hmm. and so when you say you know a, a turnkey fixed cost project that means you know you quote a number and and that's what you come in at you know and if there's cost savings to be made there you can figure it out on your end but if there's cost overruns that's your that's your problem as well right that's correct and correct. so yeah. this is pretty and with Oh, sorry. I, cut I was you just going to say we're, we're doing the Magino project and the Schistus project on the same basis. And I've worked for you know several different uh, mining consultants and contractors, and and that's a pretty uh, rare uh, offering to, to to give a company. And you know many consultants and and or contractors have a reputation for kind of underbidding jobs and then building in the the um, the profits and cost overruns and. You know, why do you think you guys are able to do that? And, you know, frankly, why do you want to do that, given that, you know, it's not an industry norm? Yeah, a um, couple of things. One, we've got a really good database of projects. So we only do this where we've got historical data. So we know, you know, how much concrete, steel, et cetera, all those commodities go into to projects of a certain size type. So, you know, we're pretty sure of our, our, our numbers. Um, the, the financiers really like it, you know. It gives surety to the financiers and banks. Um, it, it, it gives the, the, the boards of, of the of the smaller resource companies also like it because of the same reason, and and it can, delivers a good outcome at the end of the day. And we can take a client and say, look, you know, that's what you're going to get. Are you happy with that, or would you like to modify it? Um, you know, is there anything there, you know, that you, you you're not not comfortable with? We can deal with so. It allows us to then get in and do it in the shortest time frame possible um, for, for the lowest cost, um, and because we're we're confident of the quantities, etc. You know, it delivers a good outcome for us. Mm -hmm. We negotiate. We negotiate on an open book basis. We show the client our costings. We agree the we agree the numbers, and then close the book and execute. So, um, it, it it really encourages innovation. I believe, I think when you're just selling time and materials for hours, it discourages innovation. All it does is want, want the contractor or the service provider to maximise the hours mm -hmm. rather than looking at the overall solution. So it encourages us to innovate, which is you know kind of what we're about. Yeah, and you're just aligning your incentives, I guess, with the clients. Correct. Yeah, 100%. So I've been told... Tell me if this is correct, that you uh, founded Asenko when you were 31 years old. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So to me, that seems absolutely wildly young. Uh, most engineers are just, you know, if they're lucky, kind of running their first project by that point. So, you know, how do you go at, at that age to founding your own firm? And, and was there... I mean, were you were you clever about it? Did you line the work up first, and then you you started the firm on the back of the work, or did you just say, "Look, it, we're going to try to build this thing and get after it"? Second one, that's exactly what happened. No, there was no you know easy entry; just kind of you know it seems like a good thing to do when you're 31. You kind of don't understand risk like you do when you're <laughs> 61, yeah. um, and also you kind of go, "Well, you know, if I failed here." Uh, get a job and you know life moves on yeah. um so when you're younger i guess the downside's probably not as not as great as it is when you've got a bit more experience and and i kind of felt that i needed to do it to see whether we could offer something that was different that the market hadn't experienced and hopefully be successful at it one day and i always thought we were going to be successful but i didn't know what that success really looked like like mm. i think the people that go well here's my 10-year plan from when i'm starting this business 
you just don't you just don't know you know you don't even know you've got a business for the first five so um i look at you know, a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of uh, you know weekends work and all, you know, all that sort of stuff but yeah you, know, you just sort of sit stick at it and believe in your your team and believe in yourself and wait for a few breaks and away you go you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, sort of young engineers, geologists, uh, entrepreneurial and would-be entrepreneurial people in the mining sector who are watching this. And, you know, what, what I'd like to know is, like, how, what was the first job you got? Did you find, a, like, a niche that you leaned into? Uh, you know, was it building mills or, or you know, shink, sinking shafts? Or, like, did you have something or did you just go out and start competing? I uh, just got, went out and started competing. Uh, just just uh, tap the network. That was pretty much it. And um, um, it was a, the lowest point in the mining cycle. I think copper was 62 cents a pound. So there wasn't a plethora of projects. Gold, I think, was hovering around 200, 220 an ounce. And so it was, you know, first five or seven years were pretty tough to try and scrape up business. Um, but, you know, you just kind of keep your nose to the grind and things pop up and you stay in business and generate some cash flow. That's when I learned the difference between profit and cash flow. Uh, and, and that's a, and that's a trait that stays with you for the rest of your life. I can tell you. Was there a moment though, where, you know, you kind of looked around and you were like, Oh shit, like this is a real company now. This is actually working where, you know, you're not kind of living uh, job to job to job. There's this, is, you've got the ball, the ball rolling. Yeah, that would have been about 2001, 2002 when I woke up one day and I thought, well, okay, I better start to learn how to be a leader here because <laughs> uh, this is now a real a real thing where, you know, you've got lots of people relying on you, not just the people that work for you, but their families as mm. well. And you kind of you kind of look at things a little differently and uh, start to sort of look five, ten years out and how things might look. So. Yeah, early early two thousands, um, two thousand three four. Um, yeah, exactly. That, that's what happened. Was there one sort of project that you think put you guys on the map, so to speak, or was it a series of events? Series of events. First one was Sepon Sepon yep. Copper, and it was complex metallurgically and logistically. And the second one was the Lumwana Copper project in Zambia for Equinox. Uh, which was, uh, we did that fixed price in 2006, seven and eight. That was uh, about a 400 million US fixed price contract. Um, and, you know, a 14 bank syndicate, market cap of the uh, of Equinox, 100 million. They ended up selling to Barrick for 7 billion, you know, three, four years later. Um, it was a big concentrator, our first big concentrator, and a lot of business flowed from that. So those were probably a couple of, you know, hallmarks, Constantia, Peru, same thing, brought us into South America, you know, what happened after Constantia. So there's been a few sort of beachheads along the way. And how did you um, sort of develop your your leadership skill? You know, when you when you went from being, a, you know, probably a pure engineer that's out there on the ground designing projects, you know, executing on construction to, you know, having to leave teams of hundreds or, or thousands of people. Is there yeah, that's a resources really, you tapped into there, or how'd you do it? Yeah, really good question, Jamie. I'm not. I'm not. Um, I haven't done an MBA. I'm not formally trained, um, but you know, I just kind of got a few people around me that I think are, are pretty good leaders that I um, I've watched over the years. Um, I, I've read a lot. I've. Um, I mean, I think. I think people sometimes overcomplicate it you know it's around communication it's around respect it's around you know modeling the way it's around you know providing clear vision and it's around letting people do their job i think the most difficult thing young leaders have is delegating and then holding people to account you know the whole delegating piece you're saying well you know, i'll get someone else to work on this and you get it back and like, ah, oh, it's not what I wanted. Hey, let me jump in and, you know, I'll fix that instead of getting them to fix it. And, then, you know, you go, oh, it's too hard to delegate. Why should I delegate? I'll just do things myself. And that's a big stumbling block for young leaders. And, and I just kind of just worked on it and worked, saw what worked, saw what didn't work, um, um, talked to a few consultants in the space and, you know, kind of just evolved really. And I'm still an evolving leader. I think I said to someone the other day that, 
um, you know, when, as they said to me, you're still working. I said, well, I've only just become useful at my job. So, um, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to keep working because now I'm pretty good at it, you know. Okay, well. So, I, I want to borrow from your leadership skills here because, you know, at Resource Insider, we've got a small team and I've only certainly just recently realized that I'm a massive micromanager. Uh, I've been told repeatedly uh, by people and I'm trying to kick this habit and I'm not good at it. So, you know, how did you do take that step from to delegating to, you know, kind of getting your thumb on everything? Which I'm trying yeah, to, look. I'm trying not to do it, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm failing. I know, it's the <laughs> hardest thing, Jamie. It's yeah. the hardest thing, right? Because it's like when we first started, I'd sit there stapling papers and, you know, photocopying. I'm really good at that stuff, right? But you know what? <laughs> at the end of the day, it's probably not what I should be doing. If someone else can do it, maybe not as good as me, it's not a problem. It just gets done, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that break is... You know, you've got to you've got to be able to come over and for the for the big ticket, what's important items, and not micromanage, but review, and then hold to account to deliver. It's the holding to account piece that people find difficult because that can be confrontational. You know, yeah, and, yeah. You know that that's that's oh, I'm going to avoid the holding to account. They didn't do a great job. How do I tell them? Well, okay, you tell them they didn't do a great job, and why? But you've got to tell them when they did a really good job and why they did a really good job too. Yeah. And and people tend not to do the second part, you know, and it's as important as the first. But you just gotta you just gotta to say to yourself, is it really important that I do this task or micromanage this task or let someone else do it? Well, um, it's really interesting as your perspective changes, because you know, when I was a junior engineer or whatnot, and I would get criticism, I'd always think that prick, he's just like enjoying, like grinding me down. <laughs> and then, you know, when I came into a position where I'm giving criticism and feedback, I realized how actually unenjoyable it is for, unless you're a complete fucking sociopath, like it's not something exactly. you want to be doing to people. Because you normally like the person, you want them to succeed, you just, but you also have to, you know, ensure a certain quality. And it's it's been a complete perspective shift for me of how little most people like having to criticize other people. Sure. I look, I think, I think, you know, criticism, you've done a shit job. Don't do it again. <laughs> Get out of there, right? mm, not going to work. Not going to yeah. work versus how do you think you went, you know, completing that task? Do you think you did you know, a good job at it? Do you think you could have done better? Or do you think, and eventually the person goes, you know what? I really did a shit job on that, didn't I? Yeah, you did. You know? So mm. I, I think there's many ways to do it. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll, the guy, one of the guys that works for me, Nick, he's been with me for three years and he reminded me the other day, the first criticism I ever gave him was do this better. And, uh, <laughs> I, I have since found that that is a pretty useless way to, to give feedback to people. Um, <laughs> so, okay. I want to have a, a debate with you about Australian versus Canadian engineering and mine building running operating all the rest because what I, something I find about interesting about Osenko is, you know, you guys obviously started in Australia, one of the strongest, uh, most prolific mining countries in the world. Um, but, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, it seems like the majority of your work is done out of Canada now and, and throughout the Americas. Correct. 85% of our revenue. So, okay. So a huge amount. So first of all, why? Uh, you know, why get off your home turf? Why come to the other side of the world? And, you know, anyone who's worked in this business knows the challenges of dealing with uh, horrendous time zones like that. You know, why take on those, I guess, operational challenges? Um, you know, why did you think you had an advantage in, in the Americas versus at home? Okay. Um, the Australian market is a smaller market than the Canadian American market. You know, the TSX has got thousands of resource companies on it, much bigger market, very global from, from, the, from Toronto and New York into the Americas. You're going to play in the copper business, 43% of the world's copper comes from South America, 4% or 5% in Australia. So if you're going to be in copper, you, you better be in South America. And, and so that's... Those are the big projects too, right? Those are the two, three, seven billion dollar projects where 
a firm like yours Correct. can really kind of fly. Correct. So the market is bigger. Even in down cycles, it still exists. In Australia, smaller market, um, very competitive. So on a down cycle, you're, you're going to find it tough in the Australian market. So you, you've got to you've got to go back into these other places where there's a lot happening. Um, why why do we think we could be successful? Okay. Australian mining industry, the grades and the, the, the challenges uh, are low. I'm sorry, the grades are low, the challenges are high. So you've got to come up with low-cost solutions or things don't fly, you know, low-grade gold, low-grade copper deposits, very isolated, you know, and, 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 and challenging. So the capital's got to, and we're, we're always driven innovation to do that. Mm. You go into the Americas, traditionally, you know, high-grade, can carry a lot more capital. There isn't that same push. Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, we had a competitive edge on that innovation where we we're always looking for better ways to do things. And that's what people were looking for at the end of the day. So we had something to sell. We had a big market to sell it in. Um, and then we had the challenge of, you know, how do we how do we manage this, as you say? So in 2008, uh, we went and bought three companies, spent, I don't know, 250, 280 million bucks, gave us a big, big footprint in the Americas. Um, then we tried to in, in, integrate it, which we did. Uh, then the then the downturn happened. We ran off a heap of goodwill, uh, tried all different management structures, had a lot of um, scars to prove it, and then after 10 years made it work. So... We've paid our dues, but it's it's now set us up. You know, we, we are, you know, essentially, uh, you know, based out of North America and operating through the Americas. And, um, you know, I'm glad we did it. Otherwise, we would have just struggled here in this market. Tough market here. Yeah. Okay. I got a couple of questions about that. So first, it sounds like, so basically given, I don't want to say sub-tier, but, you know, less uh, inherently valuable deposits, it forced better engineering it forced more a more disciplined approach to construction or yeah. and in, okay so as, as that is true so how do you come into a country uh you know canada or the u.s um or elsewhere in the americas where you know you have these sort of higher grade sort of easier to mine uh more forgiving assets perhaps how do you i guess how do you push that asenko culture down through the structure of a new growing company with that that would have engineers and geologists and professionals from all over the world that you know didn't have the benefit of of kind of growing up on <laughs> some shitty deposit in the outback that really forced you know the best practices and that's and you've hit it on the head jamie that's been a challenge it's you know uh, we have found over the last 10 years that this isn't for everyone's cup of tea you know you know what i mean some people like to follow the rigor and the bouncing ball and we don't kind of, they don't fit with us and we don't fit with them. And, and so, yeah, it, it's taken us a long time to, 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 to find people culturally aligned with that, that, that want to be part of that. There's, there's no doubt. And um, there's people out there. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not something that they're not aligned to. It's just something that they're not used to. Mm -hmm. And then when you... Uh, and as I say, the mind is a parachute. It works the best when it's open, right? So, you know, if you open their mind and open their their um, their engineering abilities and say to them, hey, look, you, you can actually be a bit innovative here. You know, that's what engineers are all about. All of a sudden, they, they grasp it and go, wow, yeah, okay. Never had people kind of say that we can do that. It's always been, did this last time, do the same again and again and again. Whereas us, it's... The answer is not right if you say, well, this is what we did last time. You know, that's just not the right answer. So it's taken a while, but we got there. I mean, we got some really good people in the Americas now. Okay. So I'm just looking at my notes here and thinking about the best place to go next. Um, you know, I think I'd like to talk a little bit more about the industry in general. And, you know, you, you mentioned innovation, you, you know, and, and having forced not... I guess being forced to innovate. And when we look at the mining space in general, you know, you've been at this, you know, for some years now. What do you see changing? Where do you see innovation focused um, 
I guess, over the coming years? I mean, you know, the, okay. I, I think ESG is obviously a big one of this, but, you know, is yeah. that part of it? Where, where, where do you see the big challenges and the big opportunities here? Okay. So, you know, we've had this, this whole analytics thing, you know, measuring oil temperatures and, you know, engine pressures of trucks and stuff like that. And yeah, all great stuff. And, you know, all this terabytes of data every day and, you know, this, you know, artificial intelligence doing its thing and telling you what to do. And, you know, you, you, you'll get a few percentage points improved. Great. But let's, let's look at what's happening to grey. You know, you've got, you've got 25 years ago, we were mining 2.1% copper. Now we're down to sort of point, I think the average mine grade is 0.6, something like that, and falling. We're working on projects where, you know, you're, you're 0.32% copper with a bit of gold, you know, half a, half a gram gold and stuff. You know, you're shifting dirt fundamentally, processing dirt, grinding dirt, um, adding water to it, storing all of this mud that's got absolutely no value in it. And, and I think the, the, the challenge is if we can somehow use ore sorting or other techniques to, to actually increase that grade so we don't have to transport, mine, uh, process all this barren material, the, the savings aren't a few percentage points. They're tens and tens and tens of percentage improvement. Mm. You know, the water usage is big. The power usage is big. You know, 3%, I think, of the world's power is used to grind rock or something. You know, it's just a massive number. And so I think from a processing perspective, if we can look at better ways to a high-grade material so we don't have to process all this rock, that's going to be a big one for the industry, I think. Um, the other one is around water usage and, and water reclaim. Challenge. We need to. We need to get on top of it. We need to look at maybe dry stack tailings, so we don't, you know, don't store water in tailings, um, and we recover water. It's a very expensive commodity. Um, tailings, I think, is another area. Um, how we store waste, and if we can reduce the amount of waste we store as well by, you know, high grading and, and all sorting, that's an advantage. But also looking at ways to. To, to better store tailing materials so that, you know, we don't have the environmental issues and the safety issues we've had, which are a lot on the industry, um, and we minimise land disturbance because, you know, the industry is not going anywhere. We're, we're there. We've got to figure out ways of minimising land disturbance, minimising water usage, minimising tailing storage, uh, all of those sorts of things. I think they're the challenges, and that's what excites me about, you know, the opportunities that are out there. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And now, do, you know, you, let me think of the best way to approach this. So you work with a lot of big financiers in the sector. Um, you know, obviously you're, you're engaging with them all the time. Uh, resource capital funds is a, a shareholder of a Sanko. I assume you have a close relationship with them. Have you seen the, criteria uh, of these big capital allocators in the sector change over the last several decades in terms of what they're looking for, what they expect over out of projects that are being built and created? Yeah. You mean from a, from an ESG perspective or just in general? Uh, let's say from both. Let's say from both. Yeah. Look, I think, I think they from an ESG perspective. <clears throat> yeah. Very different approach. Um, over probably, I would say the last two years uh, where, you know, they're actually talking about it and they're starting to, you know, create guidelines for how they want that that to look. Um, you know, we work in the coal space. That's a really difficult space to finance at the moment. Mm -hmm. We don't do thermal coal, but, you know, we're working in the metallurgical coal space. And, you know, I don't think investors can distinguish between metallurgical coal and thermal coal. Coal is coal as far as they're concerned. So I think that space is going to have to come up with some innovative ways to finance. Um, but in general, a lot more emphasis on the ESG areas. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the other thing that I've seen a bigger emphasis on from investors is quality of management teams, um, a lot more uh, 
activism is not the right word, but influencing of management teams and perhaps in the past. Um, I think the, you know, criteria for acceptance of risk and risk return um, has changed as, as well. Mm. And what investors are prepared to invest in, what commodity and what return they're looking for uh, and what country. You know, that, that's been, a, that's been a, a big part of it as well. So um, I think I think the big one, though, has been this this whole ESG carbon footprint uh, situation. Yeah, probably the last two years. An exponential in the last two years, I reckon. Yeah. Something that interests me uh, particularly about what you do and I think will interest a lot of our, our, our listeners is, you know, often – money starts moving within the industry at the ground level prior to it being really reflected in the market. And what I'm wondering now is, you know, where do you see uh, money moving? Where do you see projects being built that people aren't quite aware of yet? Is it, is it in certain parts of the world? Is it in gold? Is it in copper? Do you see these big companies that you work with starting to say, okay, look at, we got to ramp up X or Y and start, you know, whether it's exploring or building out new assets, where do you see the trends moving in terms of what mining companies are focused on? Uh, mate, I think, I think the whole, I think what's a fancy word, um, energy transition. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, those, those commodities and metals around that, the strategic metals. So the whole battery metal thing, you know, lithium, nickel, cobalt, really quite big at the moment. Yeah, you know, battery technology is going to change, so that mix is going to change. So, myself, I, I wouldn't bet the farm ten years out on those things because you know th- that that'll jump around a little bit. You know, you've got cobalt sitting in the Congo, and people go, "Shit, I'm not going to go and bloody rely on an industry where sixty plus percent of my material comes from you know uh, an unstable environment." So, I think those those commodities are going to change a little bit. But for me, copper, you know, just you know, it's, it's, we all know the numbers, you know, five times the amount or four times the amount per electric vehicle. I just think short supply, hard to find. Um, expiration hasn't turned up the tonnes. Um, you've got the whole electrification, renewable piece. I mean, the copper side is just, you know, the one for me that's just going to keep powering on. If, if this is a, a real kind of, you know, energy transition as such, yeah. if it is real, it does look real. And, it's, and it, there's just no quality projects out there, you know. Um, someone was telling me the other day Las Bumbas was found in 1907 and only got developed five years ago. You know, it's like, you know, pick a pick an Escondida. They're not there, you know. Any, anything that we're working on is kind of good for 50 to sort of 70,000 tonne of metal um, and they're big projects because the grade's low. So, you know, that's going to continue to uh, power on. Is it gonna is it gonna create um, you know alternate you know um, materials as a replacement? I don't think there is any, so that's gonna struggle. So I think that copper market's the one to really focus on. And we've been in it for quite a while and we've set our whole business up around it. We, we think it's got a long way to go. I think the strategic metals as well, you know, the um, the rare earths, I think that you know there's geopolitical reasons around why you know that's going to bounce around a little bit and i think the emphasis will be you know out of china and other opportunities um but it's not a big market i mean they're called rare earths for a reason because they fit in a, they fit in this class you know yeah so um yeah so and of course the gold and the silver you know keep those printing presses printing uh, i don't think that's going to go anywhere in hurry either so um, I'm sitting around trying to find now what the next kind of wave of interest is going to be in, you know, in commodities, and I haven't come up to any great conclusions just yet. But what about nickel? That, what do you think about nickel? Yeah, look, and again, it's around it's around the battery side of it, isn't it? I mean, what is it? You know, twelve and a half kilos of nickel per battery. You know, if if the Brainiacs invent some other battery that's kind of this big and plugs into a Tesla and Runs for a thousand kilometres, so it mightn't have nickel in it, you know, and that's where we're going, right? These these batteries are going to get smaller. Current density per you know, square centimetre are going to get larger. Who knows what commodity? If you jump on batteryuniversity.com, you know, there's tons of technologies people are looking at. So, you know, I think I think that that's really, you know, going to be great for the next few years. But ultimately, 
I think um, who knows where we're going to end up with it. Recycling of batteries, you know, they only got an eight-year life. The difficulty in recycling, I think, is going to be an interesting opportunity as well. Um, I, I, I do do know one thing, though, that thermal coal production will probably decrease over time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, a lot of our viewers, and certainly myself, uh, would agree that, you know, the focus really should be on copper and precious metals. And when you're thinking about these projects, you know, I think it'd be useful for people at home who, who don't have a technical background, who often do a lot of their own research. You know, what do you look for, for what makes a great project? You know, uh, you invest in this sector as well. What are you looking for, even if you're not out there building it? Okay. A couple of things. One, the people behind the company. Number one, if I don't, if I don't know the background or if they're questionable background, I won't invest. Um, the other thing I think that's that's important is, apart from your know, country, country risk, you know, all those sorts of things, is great. You know, I remember my first day when I graduated university. My boss said to me, "Great is king. Don't ever forget it." And and I haven't forgot it. You know, so I, I always try and look for things that have got fairly good grade, low strip ratio. If they're open pitable. Um, you know, will they ever get permitted, all that sort of stuff. I happen to be on the board of a Toronto listed company called C3 Metals. Yes. And yeah, so we've got a we've got a great project in in Peru called Jasperoid and uh, you know, drill results, you know, things like, you know, sort of hundred plus meters at 1.8% copper and you know, sort of 30, 40 meters at six or seven percent copper, this sort of thing, you know, just really good grade in a SCARM deposit, well, you know, when you've got grade, you look at that and you go, well, you know, I can easily open pit to 200 metres and I can, you know, have a low strip ratio. You've got a project, you know, don't have to worry on finding a, a big porphyry, which there might be one there. So I always say always say that, but, you know, ease of processing because what's the point of having a high-grade gold thing that's refractory, you know, mm-hmm. and you've got, to, you've got to employ some complex bloody technology to extract it. So... Yeah, that's probably the one I look at, Jamie, more than anything, I think. What attracted you to C3? I mean, I don't know of any other boards you're on. If, if I might be missing some, but of a junior company, or the, is there anything else? Um, oh, look, you know, I got approached by Tony Manini, um, who essentially found the Sepon Copper Deposit. He's probably one of the better geologists that I know. And he said, look, you know, there's this company, this is about seven years ago, very small market cap got a project in Jamaica, but I think it's a reasonable project. Management's probably not going to done a great job with it. So essentially we refinanced it and took control of it and changed the board and management. And then we went looking for a project. We looked at 250 projects or 200 projects through the Americas. And we had to satisfy certain criteria. We wanted um, advanced exploration that wouldn't take us long to get to a resource good country um, in in copper or gold and had to have open pitable material near surface. So we found this project um, sitting in a private company, um, unlisted, so that never been on the market before. And we looked at it really quite good. It had, I think, 55 holes in it, 52 returned mineralisation over a pretty good area, good grade and good length of... Um, of intersex and um, we bought it um, and Yale Simpson's on the board as well. Um, you, you know of Yale mm-hmm. um, and uh, raised money, friends and family, um, <clears throat> enough to sort of start a drilling program and uh, and then we did a we did a, a bought deal about uh, three or four months ago. Uh, COVID slowed us down a little bit and we've started a three and a half thousand first phase uh, drilling and we just about through that and we're about to start on the next six and a half thousand metres. We'll have that completed at the end of this year. So we've, we started our, uh, I think our first results of the first drilling program came out three or four weeks ago. They were, they were fantastic mm-hmm. results. Just confirmed that. Yeah, did you, you would have seen it. So they're great numbers. And um and so we think we think we got something that's looking pretty special there. It's about forty k from Las Bombas, um, and uh, looks like a decent scan deposit. 
Um, we're testing that over the next few months and we'll also test to see if we've got a porphyry sitting underneath it. So I'm quite excited about it. I I I I, I just think that you know high grade near surface material, uh, good infrastructure, it's it's it, it could develop pretty quickly, I think. And that's C3 metals for people at home that want to check that out. Yeah, right? C3 metals. Yeah, CCCM.V. Great. So you mentioned something uh, I've got in my notes here that I wanted to ask you about, and that's uh, COVID-19. Now, you know, obviously the whole world has been dealing with challenges the last year and a half. I think it probably gets particularly challenging when you're running an engineering company that has projects all over the world and people everywhere. How how has this impacted sort of life at Insenco, Asenco, and how are you how are you guys dealing with this? How much time you got? Um, <laughs> we got look, time. Uh, we got lots of time. Oh man, uh, look, it's it's um, you know, last year was pretty challenging. We didn't really know where we were going, right, with this whole COVID thing. Sitting here a year ago, March of last year, it was like you know, deer in headlight. What's going on here? And I think the whole world felt that way. The biggest difficulty we've had is moving people around. We still can do it. Not easy, but doable. So we worked our way through that. And then it was around how do we control COVID on our project sites? I mean, at the time, we were doing the Minahusta project in Peru Mm -hmm. for um, uh, Minso, which is a private group. Um, And that was about one and a half billion US project, sulfide oxide, yeah, you know, we had four and a half thousand people on site during construction. Then COVID hit, had to demobilise them because Peru got locked up. And then uh, a month later, we had to remobilise, test, manage COVID. Now, I've learned more about COVID testing than probably I care to want to know. And then we put in a whole bunch of protocols, um, manage the COVID. Not an issue. We can construct, um, deal with it. Adds lots of cost. Lots of cost. Um, and then, you know, we, we've got these other projects we're working on. Again, it's all manageable with the right protocols, no issues. You know, we can, we can, we can work through it. Uh, supply chains are affected a little bit, you know, shipping, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, again, all manageable. Um, but the most difficult thing for me personally is that I spend half my time uh, travelling the network, mm-hmm. visiting projects, clients, offices, I haven't left. I haven't left Brisbane since uh, March of last year, and that's been fairly difficult. You know, Zoom's fantastic and Teams and all that, but it's starting to work a bit thin, I must admit. And um, and shifting people, project teams around the place, it just takes us much longer to get approvals to do that. And we eventually do do it, so we can work in it. Um, that, that's that's the thing about the mining industry, right? Which people don't quite get. You know, we're all about health and safety. So we know how to deal with these sort of issues probably better than most industries. We just jump in, you know, we start testing, we do this, we do that, you know, we manage the risk uh, versus other industries we're kind of, well, you know, what do I need to do here? So yeah. we can operate in it. Because Australia is locked down 100%, isn't it, at this point? Yeah, it's yeah. like island, island Alcatraz, I call it. And you can't come or leave, no one's coming in, no one's coming out, that's it? Uh, I think 500 people a day are allowed to come in um, and then they get put in two weeks quarantine in a hotel irrespective of being vaccinated or not. So to leave, I had I would have to get uh, approval to leave and then when I return, I have to I have to do two weeks quarantine, which isn't quite attractive. And it's and it's in a hotel supervised. You can't. It's not, yeah. you know, do it at home sort of thing. That's even Having worse than that, Canada. We got, Jeez. we got no COVID, but... You know, um, people are starting to, you know, businesses want to get out and do business, you know. And, you know, metal prices have been running up a bit lately. And you know, how much of that would you attribute to these sort of lockdowns and to the, the havoc that they've wreaked on supply chains around the world? Mm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, look, I don't think I'd, I'd put, you know, gold and silver in that category. I think that's you know, economic related, and I wouldn't put copper. I mean, supply demand. I don't. I don't see um, you know kind of close relationship with the, a metal trading group, and I don't see a lot of a lot of material and metal stuck in places, not getting out and about. Mm-hmm. Um, now, my gut feel would have to say no, Jamie. I don't think so. I mean, iron ore here. There's there's record shipments going out mm-hmm. this financial year. I think the highest on record. 
coal's come off a bit, but that's not COVID related, I don't think. You know, that's a whole China concept that's going on there. No, I don't think I don't. I, and you'd say the majority of mines are still operating more or less business as usual, and construction is is advancing uh, sort of throughout the yeah. world. Yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing any reductions in it. I mean, I think in Western Australia, there's been some reductions of throughputs because they can't get workers because the government won't let east east coast workers go into Western Australia. They put hard stop on that mm -hmm. border. So I guess that's COVID related, but um, if they could get the workers, they'd pump out the tons. Okay. Okay. Well, Zimmy, we're coming up on an hour now. I want to be respectful of your time, but you know, before we go, as I mentioned before, a lot of people that listen to this are, are younger uh, professionals within the sector. For people that are, are still advancing to their career, they want to take more entrepreneurial role or, or take the next step. Is there anything you'd recommend in terms of uh, experience or education or continued learning that you think is really a game changer for, you know, the hundreds of people that you've, you've worked with over your career or yourself, perhaps? Yeah, look, I think, I, you know, I think the best advice if I'm able to give some advice is, you know, if you believe in yourself and you believe in something, just keep saying it and keep doing it and keep pushing ahead, you know. Um, you know, I think I think the hardest thing, and you can go out and get the education, the MBA and all that sort of stuff and, and you know, be super qualified, and I suggest you do that because, you know, business is getting more complex. It's not getting any less complex. Um, but at the end of the day, if... If you have a goal, well, set that goal and just go at it and believe it every single day and keep saying it to yourself and back yourself, you know. I think that's one of the things that I've learned is, you know, when you back yourself and, and you drive yourself to that goal, you generally get there in one shape or form. And I see a lot of people kind of have negative thoughts once they kick off, you know. Never do that. I think you just got to be as positive as you possibly can and go for it. All right. Well, Zimmy, I don't think we're going to find a better place to leave it than that. Thank you very much for taking the time today. Yeah, no worries, Jamie. Good to, good to talk to you. Hopefully I can come and have a beer with you one day, mate. I hope so. Hopefully sooner. You know what? I've been me meaning to have a trip to Australia, so maybe I'll, I'll get there before you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Thanks again. Okay, mate. Cheers. Cheers.